Over the last couple of weeks, dear friends, we began a series of sermons in the lead up to Easter, covering the whole Triodion season, both the preemptive three weeks that we are currently in, as well as the five weeks of, of Lent. And the topic is finding the path. Orthodox Christian spirituality. In the first uh, installment, we spoke about spirituality as an idea and as a definition, and we brought some examples of modern spirituality, such as hugging trees and, and many other examples, and how that may or may not be congruent with Orthodox Christian spirituality. In last week's instalment, we spoke about discipline and training and how important discipline and training are in our spiritual life and how important it is to have a spiritual guide in our life as well, a spiritual father. Today we're going to talk about prayer and the liturgy. The gathering par excellence of what we are and what we do here every Sunday. While Orthodox devotion does not generally focus on body parts, such as the sacred heart of the Roman tradition, it would be appropriate to call the divine liturgy the heartbeat of Christ's body. Not just the offering of the divine liturgy, but also a prepared reception of the Holy Eucharist. Holy Eucharist, old-fashioned word for the communion that we give out to people. From the Greek, Eucharistia, thanksgiving. And in the ancient church, the act of communion, the sharing of wine and bread as body and blood of Christ, was known as the Eucharist, the Eucharistia, the Thea Eucharistia, the Divine Eucharist. This is of absolute importance, and it is based on the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Listen to this. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Can't say it more graphically. At other moments, like in the Last Supper, he says, take, eat, this is my body, drink of this, all of you, and it's a bit softer. And just based on those words, Many denominations say, yeah, it's just a symbol. It's just a metaphor. Um, well, if we skip that quote from Jesus Christ, maybe we can come to that conclusion. But he's very graphic in that statement. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's pretty absolute. No soft metaphors here. And so the question is, what happens when we offer the divine liturgy? What is this that we do every Sunday? Is it a show? Is it a spiritual play? Is it something acted out or enacted for our edification, make us feel good? What is it that Jesus started at the Last Supper that we continue to this day? And the answer is, when we gather to offer the Divine Liturgy, we come together to be the fullness of the body of Christ in whatever place we happen to be offering it. Wherever we might be around the world, Every Sunday, you are going to have 
this prayer said around the world together, virtually together, considering the time zones. But that's even nicer because you have for the whole day this prayer going. The late Father Alexander Schmemann wrote in his book, The Eucharist, the following words. The liturgy is the sacrament of the assembly. Christ came to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. John chapter 11. And from the very beginning, the Eucharist was a manifestation and realization of the unity of the new people of God gathered by Christ and in Christ. We need to be thoroughly aware that we come to the temple not for individual prayer, but to assemble together as the church. And the visible temple itself, the building, is but an image of the temple that is not made by hands. This gathering, this assembly, we are the church, not the building per se, we, the body. We are gathered by Christ and in Christ. We come together to be with him and of him. To say that we are going to church is a profound statement of what Christian life is supposed to be, centered and focused on Jesus Christ, eating and drinking with him at his table in his kingdom. To say that we are going to church means that we are going to show the world all the holiness and perfection of God as we worship him. We do not gather as a collection of isolated persons who happen to encounter each other as we separately make our way toward God. And there's a place for individual prayer, and I will cover that today. But we gather as members of one living organism called the body of Christ, Soma Christu. And this is straight out of the New Testament. First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. You are the body of Christ and members individually. In other words, there is no lone ranger in the Christian religion. There is no one who is an island unto himself. The Orthodox Christian faith is the religion of a community of people. We become members of this body when we are joined to Christ in baptism. And it is when we come together and offer the Eucharist that we become one with each other. Again, St. Paul is very direct in his teaching. First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So far, so good. That's the liturgy. Let's talk about personal prayer. Orthodox and many other Christians recognize the centrality of the Eucharist in their lives, even if they do not grasp all the details of why it is so important. Even an increasing number of Protestant communities have adopted a Eucharist-centered worship. There was a time when the Eucharist in some Protestant denominations was a once-a-year thing. Likewise, Few Christians of any stripe would underestimate the importance of prayer, even if they personally pray very little. Perhaps part of the reason for not praying much is that we sometimes have some very odd ideas about what prayer is and what it does. If we have no direction in the matter, the attitude might be to pray infrequently. In other words, prayer is only done when we need 
something from God. And for as long as we are young and healthy, that is quite a distance apart from those moments. But dear friends, prayer is a conversation with God, learning about God, remembering God. As an act, it is beyond the ability of no one. Everyone is capable of prayer. Anyone who can speak and think can pray. No great learning or scholarship is required in order to pray. And fortunately, you don't have to be a saint. But you do need to have a desire for God. Prayer requires an act of will. We must make a decision to pray and struggle with the problems of perseverance and distraction that will inevitably occur. If you only pray when you feel like it, let me tell you, you will pray very little. So you have to push yourself a bit. We mentioned discipline and training last week. You have to set goals. At its most basic, prayer is talking to God in simple, direct, and clear language. It's not necessary to use fancy words or impress God with either our piety or our vocabulary. The best way to pray is to speak from your heart, glorifying God for being the source of life. That's adoration. And we'll be talking about adoration next week. Asking for our needs to be met. That's petition. Asking help for others. That's intercession. Speaking words of gratitude for the blessings we have been given. That is thanksgiving. All those kinds of prayer should be part of how we talk to God in a balanced, healthy way. Learning to have a balanced prayer life, by which I mean keeping the emphasis off ourselves and focusing it on God, is the reason we often begin with prayers that have been used by many others before us. What do I mean? I've just spoken about personal prayers being speaking simply and straight from the heart. That's good. But it only gets you so far. There is value in what we might term prescribed prayer. Prescribed prayer is prayers that have been written in the past by people who have had some great insight, spiritual insight, and have been able to articulate what we can't articulate. And it opens our eyes, prescribed prayer, opens our eyes to the possibilities of the things we can pray for, other than our material needs. Every prayer that we use in the liturgy, every prayer we use in Vespers, in Orthros, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, is prescribed, it's pre-written, but it gives us a model, and there is value in that. In some denominations, prescribed prayer is unacceptable. You should only pray by yourself. In the Orthodox Church, both are valuable. Pray by yourself, express by yourself what you want to express, but also allow the possibility of being inspired by something bigger and greater. Guess what? Even Jesus gave prescribed prayer to his disciples when he gave them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, he said, pray like this every day. He didn't say, pray whichever way you like. He gave them a prayer that he developed for us. There is nothing wrong with using written prayers from a book to get ourselves going and to help us keep our focus in prayer, especially if we are having trouble finding words of our own. Certainly, the ideal is to pray in our own words, but our own words can often become self-centered, self-serving, 
and let's, let's be honest, a bit vague. The Lord's Prayer and other well-written prayers of the past start by praising God and then move on to other matters. They provide the springboard for our own efforts, keep us focused in sound teaching, and prevent us from wandering off into our own ideas. Such prayers are in the truest sense a manifestation of the tradition, that which is passed on to us. We're not the first people to pray, and our prayers, although uniquely our own, are still part of the great river of Christian experience that flows down from the Incarnation to our day. There is nothing new under the sun. If you thought some rock star wrote that line, you're wrong. It's the Bible again, and it's from the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. What we deal with in our relationship with God is not different from what the saints and ordinary Christians who have gone before us have dealt with in their lives. And we can benefit from their example. We learn about God in prayer precisely because we talk to Him. The surest way to get to know anyone is, is to spend time with that person, focusing on them and speaking with them. This is how it works in human relationships with our friends and loved ones, and this is how it works in a relationship with God. So many people so, know so little of God. Why? Because they spend no time in prayer. It's hard to know someone you share nothing with, and talking is part of the sharing. We may not even mean to share thoughts and feelings directly, but as we talk, we let little bits of ourselves out for others to encounter by the way we emphasize a phrase or the expression we have when we speak. And so, if we allow prayer to be a dialogue in which we actually listen for God to share and communicate with us, as opposed to a monologue, one way, we can learn about his love, goodness, and holiness because they will be conveyed to us, not so much in words, but by encounter and action. Heart can touch heart. And when God touches our heart, which is the reasoning, communicating part of our soul, we learn of his will for us in matters great and small. When the words are done, when we have asked what we can and prayed for whom we will, when we have praised and adored to the best of our ability, when we have used up all the words we have, what's left? Just encounter with God. In a work entitled The Incomprehensibility of God, St. Gregory of Nyssa, 300s, writes of something like this. Night designates the contemplation of invisible things in the same way as Moses, who entered into the darkness where God was, this God who makes of darkness his hiding place, surrounded by the divine night of the soul, she, the soul, ipsihi, seeks him who is hidden in darkness. She possesses indeed the love of him whom she seeks, but the beloved escapes the grasp of her thoughts. Now, darkness, of course, is often a word we don't associate with God, but that is skotos in Greek. St. Greg of Nyssa uses the word gnophos, and gnophos is different to skotos. 
Gnophos is a divine mist or inability to know. You know it's there, but you can't fully grasp it. That's the image being conveyed here. The experience we have in darkness. We know something's there, but we can't see it. That's gnophos. Finally, remember that also that although we must choose to pray, that does not mean the prayer is only the result of our own effort. We should allow God to empower us to seek and to pray by the grace of his Holy Spirit. This is not my idea. St. Paul writes in Romans, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts and knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans chapter 8. Prayer is a cooperative effort between the Holy Spirit and ourselves, and the Spirit will guide and direct our effort if we open up to God. I will close with a quote from St. John Climacos, 600s. God gives prayer to the one who prays. God gives prayer to the one who prays. If we give ourselves over to the act of prayer with faith and perseverance, prayer will come.